You're listening to episode 14 of the Confident Writer Podcast with Jane Pike. I love hanging out together on the podcast. Have I told you that? I don't feel like I tell you that enough. There it is. I love it. (laughs) Today is all about overwhelm. And gosh, when was it? Last week, I posted on my Facebook page about how I had been taken down over that weekend by overwhelm. And truthfully, it had been something that had been progressively building up over the week before as well. To give you a little bit of a backstory, I had planned to completely knock the week before out of the ballpark. I had so much on my list that I wanted to get done and they were things that I'd been planning to get done for a while. I had a pathway in Joyride to film and finish up. I had podcasts to record. I've got two young children so there's always obviously ongoing things in relation to their health and happiness. My horses I wanted to get worked. The list went on Perhaps that's telling in and of itself, but what I found was those things didn't get done or many of them didn't get done. And the reason for that was as of Monday, I got struck out by the flu. (laughs) Now, a totally legitimate reason for perhaps not being as productive as I might normally have been. However, for whatever reason, and I can't exactly pinpoint the reason, but for whatever reason... By the end of that week, everything that I had planned to have got done and didn't, I think in combination with feeling a little bit physically lousy and perhaps not getting outside and doing the things which helped me feel well in every sense of the word. So none of that happened. And by the weekend, I felt like I was in quite a dark place and that dark place I attribute to that feeling of overwhelm. Now, I posted this on Facebook and it was one of the biggest gifts that I could have given myself inadvertently and unintentionally because off the back of that, you all shared with me your stories of overwhelm and I got beautiful messages, even photos of beautiful things like a leaf that had been crystallized in the morning frost that day. Just really touching, lovely things. And I was really blown away. I wasn't surprised because I know how amazing you guys are and how important it is that we all connect and share what it is that's really going on for us. And that's something that I'm in touch with on a regular basis. You know, when people join up my members program, for instance, usually one of the biggest surprises that they get is this understanding or realization that they're not the only one, you know, that, wow, other people feel like this. I thought this was my deficiency or this was my thing. And I'm like, no, we're all human. We're all adventuring together. Confirmation of humanity has been restored. (laughs) So you know, I guess that was my thing. And part of the motivation for sharing that and the practice that I step into with sharing that comes because I can trick myself into feeling less than worthy or perhaps even shamed because of the work that I do. I think, oh, how is it that I get to this state of feeling overwhelmed when I'm teaching every day these skills and telling other people how to manage these types of emotions in their horsing life and in their regular life? Like, what's up with that? (laughs) The big fail stamp. But actually, that's a load of BS because we're human, huh? And we're not creating the map. We're walking the road together. One of the big things that I keep in mind is that I'm here to contribute to the conversation in whatever way I can. And I feel like that contribution comes best 
if I live what I'm teaching and I practice what it is that I go on about all day and every day, because to me, that is the biggest truth teller. And when I look at other people that I gain inspiration from, it's because they're doing the same. So we can all let ourselves off the hook. You know, you, you'll have your version of my stuff <laughs> that you need to let yourself off the hook for as well. So in whatever way that resonates with you, let yourself off the hook. Practice making friends with your mind and with your heart and with your emotions. That practice of unconditional friendliness and radical compassion that we all need to step into on a regular basis. Because that is the foundation stone of change being able to accept what it is that's happening in the moment whilst being aligned to the higher intention of what it is that we want to produce or create or do with our horses and independently of our horses overwhelm let's talk about that generally I've got three different sections that I'm going to break this down into but if I was to talk about it generally Overwhelm comes when all of a sudden in your mind's eye, things become huge. You know, there's things become very general. They become overinflated and we're looking at things from a very global perspective. We even use language and words that are symbolic of how heavy and encompassing overwhelm can feel. For instance, if someone was to ask me, what do you need to do? I would say, I need to do everything. You know, everything is such a non-specific, all-encompassing word. Is there anyone that can help you? There's no one that can help me. I have to do everything by myself. Like those types of, that type of narrative is something that you'll commonly fall into when you are in a state of overwhelm because it takes you out of the specifics and it puts you in a very broad context where you actually can't see the wood for the trees. That's the second thing that tends to happen to us in an overwhelmed state. We lose our clarity and we get lost in the fog of all the to-dos and all of the things and the everythings and nothings and no ones and everyone's (laughs) that feel like they belong in that space. What the practice is that we lose at that point is the ability to translate thought into action. So instead of saying, okay, these are the options that are available to me to create some momentum and to create some energy out of this space, we feel completely impotent. We spin around in our thoughts and actually... I've only just thought of this, but really anticipation anxiety and overwhelm are like sisters because a similar thing happens in anticipation anxiety as well, where you are thinking about all of the worst case scenario options that are available to you from your present position or in your present position. And instead of taking affirmative action, so deciding on a more constructive or useful course to follow, we just spin that disc around in our minds and we leap from one negative or un, what's the word I'm looking for? Undesirable option. And we just keep looping around without actually transferring that to something useful to us. So the same thing happens in overwhelm. We, we become immobilized. We don't act on what it is that we need to act on in order to give us information in one direction or the other. What I mean by that is you might act and decide that is not the right thing to do, or that gives you information that tells you you need to do something different. And that's fine, but we we really don't even gift ourselves with that possibility. You know, we, we completely get stuck. So with this knowledge, with this knowledge, we can actually decide how it is that we want to move forward. And so this is the the course of action that I took. Knowing that overwhelm is so broad, so general, so non-specific, the antidote to it then is to be really specific. So if it's, I've got all of these things that need to be done, I need to know, well, what are all of those things? Like, let's get those down on paper. And I write, I get everything down. Like I do a big brain dump 
get a big sheet of paper. I don't use my best handwriting. (laughs) I don't even use my best pen and I just go for it. I get everything out that needs to get out so that I am downloading all of that data that's spinning around my brain space and putting it down on the paper. There is a huge liberation in that. And there's actually something really powerful in the pen to paper phenomenon that has been documented scientifically, incidentally, in dealing with pressure as well. So if you're going through this process, don't type it because there is something primal and ancient about the connection with holding a pen and writing on the paper and the translation process or the clarification process that comes from actually moving that from a thought space down onto the parchment. So do that. And then you might notice a theme. It might be that there's one particular area of your life that feels really dominant, or maybe you can tie everything together um, in one space, or you might notice there's several disparate areas that actually need individual attention. No right or wrong to this. It's just an observation. So I group everything into common areas. I'm like, okay, you're part of my horse world. You're part of my work world. You're part of my family world. You're part of my need to get myself some space world. (laughs) All of those things that are happening and are relevant for you, you might find some commonalities that allow them to be grouped together into sections and then get specific within each one of those. From that point, you can start to prioritize. It's like, okay, well, I know that I can't do everything all at once. That's just fact. That's the same for everyone else. It's got nothing to do with me being somehow incompetent or lacking in time management skills. It's just that right now I can do one thing at a time. And as soon as I start to do that one thing, I'm going to feel a sense of pressure alleviation because obviously I've ticked something off that needed to be attended to. So that's what I did. I got everything down. I organized it from my piece of paper into separate groups. And then I started to pay attention to the most imminent things that needed to get done. And I created a time frame for those things. So it's like, okay, over the next week, when I hit Monday, I'm just going to start to get this stuff done so that I move out of that overthinking space, which is the absolute brother of procrastination. And that's what we're going to get into in the next part. But It's very easy to fester in overwhelm. And so translating into action is what creates the momentum. Now, in the first instance, when you actually go to do something, there's almost a physical feeling of stuckness in that space because the energy has become so stagnant. So once you actually do, once you get into that doing phase, it becomes much easier to do the next thing. The first couple of things are the hardest simply because the plane hasn't left the ground yet. But once you're in flight, you create your own momentum and it's much easier to get things moving. Once you've done that as well, once you've started to act and and realize that you're actually perhaps more capable than you thought, or you can actually do this, (laughs) once you start to act, what another thing that's really useful is to say, okay, well, how much of this could have been prevented? There are circumstances that we set up where we are firefighting things because we've left them to the last minute or we haven't delegated them or we haven't really dealt with them in an efficient way. We can be very bad at accepting help. We can be very bad at giving over things to other people or saying, you know, this is something that is coming up for me as a repetitive pattern. And anything which is a repetitive pattern is is like a crystal ball. It's your ability to look into the future and say, why is this thing coming up for me? I know that it keeps coming up for me. And if I am not going to do something different to actually change the course of how that's looking, chances are it's going to come up again. So where would I like to take this and what action and decision does that require of me in order to be able to move that in a different direction? Moving on to the second part, The thing about overwhelm is that it's not usually just the overwhelm that's the problem. We can be accepting of that feeling in the moment, but the problem comes from the judgment and from the self-flagellation, giving ourselves a good whack with the itty bitty shitty committee stick. (laughs) And that comes of any experience where we really fail to practice self-acceptance and compassion. And then we go to war with ourselves. We go to war with the parts of ourselves that we believe aren't worthy or aren't good enough. 
Now, even the use of the word part or parts is super interesting. Think how often you use this word. You might say, oh, there's a part of me that's just not convinced about this or part of me can't be bothered or there's a part of me that really wants to say yes. Like it's not always related to things that we might typically perceive as negative. We recognize that there are various aspects of ourselves or parts of ourselves that form parts of our psyche and we know that they can feel differently about things at different times. Part of me wants to say yes, part of me wants to say no. The conversation I want to have around that is that all parts have a positive intent for us. We are never working against ourselves. So if there's a part of you that likes to procrastinate and this is causing problems, you know, it's easy to bash yourself up and become overly self-critical. But if we were to dig around a little deeper and discover or to think about why that's happening, we might discover that that part is actually fearful that if we were to move forward with our plans, they're going to fail. You know, perhaps it's going, it's concerned that you'll be shamed or ridiculed. And so on an unconscious level, your procrastination becomes protective. It's saying, don't do that. What if someone sees you and you don't come off the way that you want to come off? Or what, what if you get hurt? The complication is that that part in providing service in that way, in attaching a fear of a negative consequence to taking an action and therefore preventing you from taking the action, it can cause you more pain than following through ever would because you berate yourself, you miss out, you recognize the cost of not following through. But Despite that, the motivation of that part is still self-protection. I find it really liberating to think of the parts of ourselves that we're struggling with in this way. So what is that part protecting me from? What does that part prevent me from processing or facing or accepting about myself? Overwhelm for me, and this was, is particularly what I noticed about the last week. Overwhelm for me comes up when I hit a new upper limit or a success threshold. So in the case of the, the new body of work that I produced, it's not enough to produce the body of work, unfortunately. <laughs> that creative process and that learning process and sharing process is not enough. I have to get that out there. And so that requires me to step up. It requires me to talk to you about it and say, hey, you know, I've got this online program. I really think it will help you. I'd love you to come and join me. It's, you know, confidence. It's emotional intelligence. It's resilience. It's all the things which I think makes our riding and horsing so transformational and essential but part of me resists doing that because I don't want to be seen in the wrong light you know I don't want to be seen as motivated by the wrong wrong in inverted commas purposes or for you to think about me in a certain way those are all unconscious things that come up that might prevent me from doing those things so I procrastinate on that particular thing or I may procrastinate on those particular things because I'm listening to a part of me that is protective but not necessarily right. You know, that's the other thing we have to remember, not necessarily right. However, berating yourself does nothing but add a layer of suffering onto a situation that can only be softened with kindness. So off the back of that, I want you to think about like, what what can you learn from the parts of yourself that you struggle with? This is my daily conversation. Like, what can we learn from the parts of ourselves that we struggle with? Now, I've talked about procrastination quite a lot over the course of this podcast. And so I want to expand on that a little bit now and just demonstrate, I guess, why I think procrastination and overwhelm are typically hanging out. I've been practicing this recently and it does require a little bit of a backstory. So let's go around the long way. You might have already gathered, I'm super big on honoring emotions. Like I think that there's so much value in the good, the bad, and the ugly. So all are welcome, all are accepted, and without question, they are showing up for a reason. Whether we are managing them in an appropriate and necessary way is up for question. But our job really is to tune in with the feeling and sensation that we are gifted with, to recognize the emotion that it points to, and then choose how it is we are going to adventure forward from that place. 
some things come up as patterned or habitual responses. And when that's the case, we need to make sure that we have enough presence and emotional understanding to be able to choose to disregard what it's calling us to do as well. Because even though there is realness in the feeling and in what it, what it is that's occurring, the actual trigger for that might be something which we need to distance ourselves from or repattern. So that's important. However, I'm getting a little bit off track there. I've noticed a tendency in myself on the days when I'm feeling a bit low And when I say low, I think we automatically think, oh, depressed or sad. It doesn't necessarily directly translate to that. Low could also be the lower ebb of the energy scale. So more introspective, more quiet, perhaps not as action oriented. And that's a really important place to be, huh? That's not, we don't always want to be out there and buzzing and doing all this stuff. There needs to be a recharging process and a balancing process that comes with any kind of emotion. However, I find during those times, it's very easy to use my mood state to procrastinate things, to procrastinate on things rather that are important to my higher intention or my overall plan of where I want to take things. And I don't think I'm the only one. Actually, spoiler, I know I'm not the only one (laughs) because you guys have told me that. So if I was to indulge the procrastination under the guise of feeling on the lower end of the energy scale than normal, then I end up feeling cross with myself or that's kind of the best result, to be fair. If I really give it the time of day, then I might give myself a good lashing with the itty bitty shitty committee. Um, So the practice is this. We need to accept the emotion, accept what it is that we're feeling and take action in alignment with the bigger version of ourselves. So we can feel low or sad or not okay for whatever reason, and you can be with that and notice where the feeling sits in your body. And you can simultaneously be curious about what it offers you. So the acceptance comes with not adding a story to it, to not inflating it or exaggerating it in any way. And within that, within the acceptance and within the curiosity and the wondering, you can still take action. You can still know that riding your horse is important today because that feeds into the bigger picture. You can still know that the work you need to do can still get done because you will feel better when it gets done. You can still do. So take care, this is what I'm doing, take care not to use the less effusive mood states as fodder for the procrastination machine. Acceptance of the moment, action in alignment with the higher intention. Go forth and conquer, fabulous peoples. I'm looking forward to hearing how you get on. I kaboosh, I kind of packed a lot into that one. Hey, if you're keen to join me on this crazy adventure of emotions and horsemanship and mental skills, I kind of love it. And I'd kind of love you to join me. My online program can be found at confidentrider.online forward slash joyride. Come play with us because it's really such a fantastic place to be. But until next week, I hope you have a fantastic day and I'll talk to you soon.